Um, so today is a very much a London day. All the three speakers today uh, come from London. In normal times, you, you might think, well, why not hold the conference in London? But uh, that's another thing that changed with this, uh, um, with the new situation we find ourselves in. And the first speaker is um, uh, Do Toby G from Imperial College. His title is uh, Moduli Stacks of uh, Phi Gamma Modules. Toby, please. Great, well, thank you very much. Um, Thanks for the invitation to speak here. Actually, I think I was in Montreal about 18 months ago when Ayala invited me uh, to talk here. And at the time, I was having a great time in Montreal. I was like, that's perfect. September in Montreal, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, so I'm sorry not to be there, um, but it's great that you've managed to organize the workshop nonetheless. I'm, I'm looking forward to all the other talks as well. Um, so yeah, so this is joint work with uh, Matt Emerton, everything I'm gonna say today. Um, I'm going to just try and give a brief survey of some things in our, our paper with the, uh, the same title as this and a couple of speculations towards the end. Uh, I'm going to have to kind of skip over things quite quickly, but if you want to see more details, there's obviously the, the paper itself, and I think we made some effort that the introduction is, is pretty readable. Uh, and there's also some notes on my website from a course we gave uh, in Bonn last year. Those notes at the moment haven't been revised, but we're revising them at the moment, so hopefully in a month or so, there should actually be a survey article as well. Okay, so what is this about? Um, Phi gamma modules in the title, but um, the, the kind of motivation is Gower representations. So these are always gonna be representations of the absolute Gower group of a local field. It's gonna be a periodic local field. So I fix K over QP throughout this talk. Uh, it will often, I will specialize to QP for simplicity of statements but all, everything works for a general client extension and uh, gk is always going to know this absolute Galois group so make a choice of, of uh, algebraic closure k bar take the Galois group it doesn't matter what the choice is um, and then the question i want to think about is are there moduli spaces of representations of this absolute Galois group so i'm, I'm not going to kind of motivate why we would care so much about these things but perhaps it's worth saying that uh, these are kind of ubiquitous when thinking about the Langlands program, thinking about things like uh, modularity of elliptic curves and so on. You have Gower representations coming from geometry, tape modules and so on. And uh, a lot of the techniques we know for proving theorems about Gower representations, and in particular the connections with modular forms or topomorphic forms and so on, uh, come about from thinking about not just one Gower representation, but a moduli space of them. Um, so the Gower group is, has a, a topology, it's a profinite group. Um, so it makes sense to think about, uh, I've just written representations, but all my representations will always be continuous representations. So I'm just looking at representations to uh, d-dimensional space over some ring R with some topology. So there definitely are such moduli spaces. And um, if you work over rings in which P has been inverted, in particular the L addict numbers for L not equal to P, but you could even work over Z1 on P, then you have very nice moduli spaces. Um, the basic reason for this is that the structure of the absolute Gower group, um, the kind of prime to P part of it is pretty simple. You have a wild inertia group, which you think is complicated. Um, and then you have tame inertia, which is very simple. And when you're looking at representations um, in which you've inverted P, the wild inertia is a pro P group and you don't have kind of interesting variation of representations of that. So basically the action of the wild inertia group has to basically be fixed. And then you can compute things very explicitly. You can use beta lean representations, for example. And it turns out that you get nice moduli stacks or moduli spaces. They're finite type schemes uh, or, or stacks. Um, they're even LCI, local complete intersections. Um, I think that for, for GLN, this was kind of first seen in some work of David Helm. Um, there's now a lot of work by a lot of people on this. Uh, theorems for, for very general groups. Um, you, can, you can do this for, for reductive groups and get LCI spaces. You can even do general algebraic groups. Um, but if I instead work over a ring like the periodic integers, a ring where P is not inverted, this just doesn't work. The wild inertia is, is interesting in this case, and you, get, uh, you, you don't have it behaving in a discrete way anymore. So back in the 80s, I think that the first actual 
uh, instance these modularized spaces, Mesa thought about this and kind of a, a way to get around this problem of, of the wild inertia um, kind of uh, being very complicated while still um, getting something interesting is to fix a, uh, a mod P representation. So you fix the representation of the Gower group to um, GLD of a finite field. And having fixed that, you then consider all lifts of that representation to uh, maybe an art in local ring with that residue field, or more generally a complete local Noetherian ring. And he showed that these form a nice moduli space. In fact, it's the formal spectrum of some complete uh, Noetherian local ring. So these are Mazer's uh, deformation rings, or perhaps as I set it up, this would be a frame deformation or a lifting ring. And the, you could also do this, I mean, this is not limited to working with, this doesn't really be used very much about the fact that I'm looking at the absolute Gower group of the edit field. I could be looking at the Gower group of any field, for example, Q. And in that setting, that's where the, uh, where Mazer and Mazer Tillering's work on um, kind of formulating conjectures about uh, association between these, these deformation rings are Robar and uh, Hecker algebras first happened. And then there was the work of Wiles and Taylor Wiles in the early 90s that, that actually proved that, uh, that these deformation rings in the global setting are, are sometimes isomorphic to Hecker algebras. And a large part of that work involves thinking about this local question here. So the question of whether there are kind of global analogs of all this is very, is very interesting. I probably won't have time to say anything about that today, but uh, these local deformation rings have played a very important role in, in things like the proof of the glass theorem and so on. Okay, so having said that, it's kind of unsatisfying to have to make this fix of this row bar. When you're working in the l addict case, L mod equals P, you have these modularized spaces with no restrictions at all. And it would be great to have something similar in the p -addict case. I will kind of try and convince you later of why it's a, a useful thing to have. But the question that this project is basically answering is, is how do we let this row bar vary? Okay, so here's our first theorem. So the theorem says that, uh, again, fix k, fix gk, this absolute Gower group, then there's an Ethereum formal algebraic stack uh, which, for example, the points of it over ZP bar, so the ring of integers in uh, QP bar, uh, is naturally equivalent to the continuous representations of this group. So this is some space in which we've not fixed a mod P representation or anything. And we can say some, some things about this stack. Uh, it's actually the underlying reduced substack is, is actually an algebraic stack. It's finite typed and it's equidimensional of, of this dimension here. So I'll give you a couple of interpretations later of this dimension and why it's a natural thing um, to have. But perhaps I should say that this is the dimension of the associated flag variety for GLD over K. And if uh, we haven't done this, but these stacks should exist for representations to any reductive group, I guess any algebraic group, and then again, the, the dimension will be the dimension of the corresponding flag variety. So, in the description, I just told you what the ZP bar points are. Uh, you get exactly the same kind of thing, for example, for the FP bar points. So the FP bar points of this stack are just the same thing as my representations row bar from the previous slide. So it's just mod P representations of this group. So this stack, its special fiber, gives an answer to the question of is there some moduli space in which the representations row bar are varying? On the other hand, it's not true for our stack that if you start putting in, probing it with other algebras, something more complicated than uh, FP or FP bar or something, it's not true that you get an interpretation of Gower representations. So for example, there are families, I'll show you a family in a bit, uh, just over the affine line, which uh, are points, they, you, you get a family of points on our stack, if you like, but the family does not give you a representation of the Gower group valued in FPX. Okay, so this is not literally a stack of Gower representations. The definition of this is not just I take, uh, I probe it with any piadic, the complete ring, and I just look at all the Gower representations valued in that ring. In fact, as the title suggested, it's going to be instead I work with phi Gower modules. And it turns out that phi Gower modules give you the same thing as Gower representations if you're working over something like FP bar or ZP bar or an Artinian local 
FP algebra or something like this, but it's not true over something bigger than that, like the affine map. Okay, one other remark I want to just make about this is slightly technical and, and ignore this if you, uh, if it doesn't make so much sense, but I want to just emphasize this is not um, a piadic algebraic stack. So the topology on this algebraic stack is not the piadic one. And what that means, if you like, is it mod P, if I just look at the special fiber of this, it's not an algebraic thing, it's a formal thing still. So if I was talking about schemes, I'd be saying that there's some power series variables, for example. So while the underlying reduced part of this has to mention uh, this dimension of the, uh, the flag variety, sort of D choose two, the uh, whole stack has a kind of D squared dimension. So there's always a formal direction, even if you're looking at one dimensional representations, there's always some, some formal direction that doesn't uh, algebraize. Okay, so that's kind of the, the theorem. Um, I just wanted to briefly say something about the one dimensional case. So the one dimensional case is the one case of this theorem that you can prove by hand. So having said that it's not true in general that this thing is a modularized space, a modularized stack of, of Gower representations, in the one dimensional case, it is actually true. You can literally just, in this case, um, use class field theory to, to just set up everything by hand. So the, uh, I'm just gonna state everything just for QP, as I said, for, for simplicity. So the characters of the, uh, the one dimensional, the mod P characters of, of the absolute Gower group of QP uh, are of this form here. Um, I should have said uh, epsilon bar, I guess, is the mod P cyclotomic character. Character um, just given by the action on the uh, piece roots of unity. And then every character is given by taking uh, that character, the mod piece of atomic character, raising it to some power and multiple, just twisting by some unramified character. So there's this family of one dimensional kind of family of unramified twists. Let me just get rid of that for now. Um, and, and that's the only interesting thing in going on. So I have this, this discrete invariant of which power of the cyclotomic character I have. That gives me P minus one irreducible components, uh, just indexed by that power. And each of those components is just determined by where Frobenius is going. And the underlying reduced of this, you get something zero dimensional, which matches with my formula from the previous slide where I had this D times D minus one over two. So the point is you have, in this stacky world, you have a one-dimensional family by this unramified twist, this, this A is this eigenvalue of the Frobenius, but then you have an, a GM's worth of automorphisms. You can always scale your, your character by a scalar just acting trivially, so you get zero dimensions. However, the stack itself has one dimension, and that's basically because the, uh, if I'm, instead of, of looking at characters valued in FP, I look at characters valued in, say, uh, a power series ring in one variable over FP, I can start looking at other powers of the cyclotomic character, non-integral powers, and that gives me some, some extra variable. Okay, so that was something you could do in the one-dimensional case. More generally, the definition is the following. So I take a finite type uh, algebra mod some power of P, and then the actual definition is I take projective the tall Figo modules with coefficients in that particular ring. So in, in a moment, I'll tell you what a Figo module is if you haven't seen this, but it's going to be some kind of semi-linear algebra gadget. Um, and that definition was just for finite type algebras, but in fact, you can extend to general periodically complete rings um, just because you can write any such thing as a limit of finite type uh, algebras. And so it's a completely formal extension from there. And having done that, the, the identification of the ZP bar points or the FP bar points with actual Gower representations is actually, well, I say it's due to Fontaine, but Fontaine introduced this entire theory um, in order to, the, the theory of Figan modules in order to give a classification of Gower representations. So the original definition of Fontaine exactly just tells you that if you consider this modularized stack, you're going to get Gower representations when you put in um, FP bar or ZP bar, or more generally, kind of any uh, sort of Artinian FP algebra or a limit of such thing. Okay, so what is a, a phi gamma module? So take A to be again a finite type 
algebra mod to the power of p. And then a, uh, a phi gamma module is, again, I'm in, in the kind of case k equals qp, it's just a module over this Laurel series ring, uh, a double bracket, a round brackets t, and it has actions of a phi and a gamma. And the way that those have to act is they have to be semi-linear with respect to the actions of C and gamma on this coefficient Laurent series ring. Uh, uh, phi, as usual, acts by uh, phi of 1 plus t is 1 plus t to the p. And gamma is acting via this cyclotomic character. Uh, it kind of raises 1 plus t to the power of the appropriate cyclotomic character. So that's what a, a phi gamma module um, is. And I have to remember this atal condition. The atal condition is more or less that phi is invertible, but because it's semi-linear, you can't literally say it's given by an invertible matrix, but the image of phi uh, generates the module. So these are completely concrete things. And for example, it's a good exercise in the one-dimensional case to check that these actually do biject using class field theory and so on, biject with characters. Although it's a, already a somewhat complicated exercise there. Um, and perhaps I should also say that if I replace uh, QP with a finite extension. Again, there's a theory like this, but you don't have such clean formulas for the action of uh, phi and gamma. Okay, but this is, a, uh, this is something you can really write down. So I want to kind of explain why this is not, despite Fontaine's theorem, why this is not just giving us uh, a literal space of Gauss and Haitians. So let's think about the two dimensional. Um, version of this stack, so the moduli of rank two projective phi gamma modules. So it turns out the irreducible representations uh, behave much like the case of one-dimensional representations. So they give you a discrete set, there's a finite set of irreducible representations up to some unramified twist, uh, and you again get a zero-dimensional stack from each irreducible representation because you have a one-dimensional family of unramified twists and then you mod out by the automorphisms, which by Scherzler are, are just zero dimension. That gives you uh, a GM, and so you get zero dimension. On the other hand, you have uh, interesting reducible representations. And again, this is, this is a big difference between the sort of L addict and P addict case. You get a lot more interesting um, indecomposable reducible representations in this P addict case. So what I've done here is I've just written an extension of, uh, of two characters. So these, this character is the uh, one with Frobenius being sent to A, and I'm looking at the ith power of the cyclotomic character. And similarly, I've got one here with uh, B and the jth power. And typically, uh, over QP, uh, this will be, there'll be a one dimensional family of extensions. So I'll get a one dimensional family of non split extensions. And uh, hopefully, it's kind of fairly reasonable to imagine that. Uh, I can have a family just by scaling the, the line in the, in the X group. I can have a family where the extension is non-split and just specialize it to the split point. So this is the first time you see something, some actual kind of stack phenomenon here. I'm looking at these, uh, these two dimensional representations like this, this, like this non-split extension. Uh, this is giving me such a, such a representation is giving me an FP bar point of my stack, but I can have a family of these things specializing to another one. So these are not closed points. So even though this thing is some finite type thing, if it was a scheme, I'd be looking at kind of these points actually being closed, but they're not here because I got some specialization relation from the non-split extension to the split extension. So in fact, you can prove, it takes a bit of effort, but it's, it's true that the closed points of our stack of, of d dimensional representations are exactly the semi-simple Gower representations. And those, I mean, that's at least kind of this example shows you that the, the non-semi-simple things have no hope of being closed because you can always kind of scale your extensions down to the split case, but it turns out the semi-simple ones are in fact uh, always closed. So you could ask the question, are there any other interesting specialization relations in this stack? Like I got this family that I just showed you where I took a non-split extension and I scaled the extension to zero. You could ask, is there any other interesting thing or, or can we now just basically imagine what this, how things, how the points kind of relate in this stack? And the answer is there are actually a lot of other 
interesting specializations as well. So here's an actual family of, uh, of phi gamma modules. Well, in fact, I've skipped giving you the action of gamma, I've just given you the, the action of phi. But you can consider this thing, is this a family, a one-dimensional family um, over fp bar with ap being a parameter. So you can imagine, uh, if you like, you can think of this as being over the affine line with parameter ap. And for each of those, you have a phi module, and it's, it turns out you can put a commuting action of this gamma. And so this gives you a, uh, a family occurring in our stack. And it turns out that if AP is not zero, this is actually a uh, reducible, in fact, non-split reducible representation um, corresponding to it. But if AP equals zero, this specializes to an irreducible representation. So again, I should emphasize, over the whole of this, this family, I don't have a Gal representation. Point by point, or even in formal neighborhoods of points, Fontaine's equivalence between Gal representations and phi Gal modules gives you a Gal representation. But you don't get one over the whole family. And in fact, it's not so hard to check that, that this gives you that this, this, this phenomenon that you are reducible at all at one point and then specializing to an irreducible representation just means you cannot possibly be a family of representations. Basically, because you just think about the corresponding family of, of flags and the um, the flag variety is is proper, and so you don't have some way of taking a limit and then not having a uh, a reducible representation. You just look at that that one dimensional um, character that's being preserved by the Galois group, and then you take the limit along some family, and you would still have to have a uh, a non zero space that was preserved. So this is kind of the the prototypical example, and while you can make this very explicit. Um, Already, even for GL2 over uh, kind of bigger extensions than, than QP, it becomes very hard to kind of see exactly what all the possible specializations are. And in higher rank, I think things are extremely complicated. Basically, um, this is kind of just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what can happen. So another thing that can happen, for example, is that you can have families of reducible representations given by sort of powers of the cyclotomic character, and you can have those specializing to uh, extensions with different powers of the cyclotomic character. So even those those are sort of discrete invariants, they can jump as you're specializing in families. Okay, so this this kind of maybe sounds like a bit of a mess, um, but in fact it turns out that this is actually somehow exactly the kind of behavior you want to have happening. So uh, let's just look again at this this kind of GL2 QP example. So I, I have these families, I fix a value of i and j, they, these are these discrete parameters for this, uh, these powers of the cyclotomic character, and then I can vary these unramified twists. So it turns out if you do the, the computation, that gives you, thinking about those things, gives you a one-dimensional family. As usual, in thinking about the stack, you have to make sure you think about the automorphisms and quotient out by those. That's why this ends up giving me one dimension. And in fact, one dimension is what I'm expecting as the dimension of the whole stack. In this case, it was the degree of K on QP times uh, the dimension choose two. And in this case, that's one times one. And so this closure is actually a one dimensional substack. So this is actually something pretty big. And uh, it turns out there's also one extra possibility. So I will basically ignore, but for those of you who know about these things, uh, there's also an extra family coming from the Tre Ramifier extensions and, and their twists. Um, and the theorem is that, in fact, these are exactly giving you the irreducible components. So in this case, this is perhaps not totally surprising because I'm basically writing down all of the reducible representations. And I'm saying that when I take the closure, I, uh, I just pick up the irreducible representations. In fact, I showed you how that happened just now. And I also said that the irreducible representations give you zero dimensional substacks. So it's probably not completely shocking that this is what happens. But more interestingly, the same thing happens in arbitrary dimension. So you have a very explicit description of the irreducible components of this stack. And they're just indexed explicitly by this, these tuples of integers. Um, and uh, this may seem, this kind of condition down here may seem reminiscent of something in, in representation theory, which I'll, I'll come to in a bit. These, 
uh, these, these kind of P restricted condition also comes up when you're thinking about representations, highest weight of irreducible representations. Uh, and I should say this also, I'm, I'm just kind of saying this for K equals QP to avoid having too much notation, but something extremely similar happens in complete generality. So what happens is you have these irreducible components and I mean, I've, I've written their index by some tuples of integers, but it's really much more explicit than that. What happens is you take this list of integers, K1, K2, and so on, and you then just kind of consider upper triangular families of representations given by powers uh, of the six atomic character indexed by these integers, and you just consider kind of a modern split family of those things, and that gives you a dense open uh, inside the, the corresponding irreducible component. So somehow, somehow everything else is picked up um, by taking kind of specializations of upper triangular families. Those are those are the kind of the big families. And if you uh, if you believe that statement, it's actually not then hard to check the statement that I gave about the um, about the dimension of the stack itself. Uh, it's not so hard to check that the dimension of one of these kind of families of non-split representations is this dimension of this flag variety, this, this degree of k on qp times d choose two. I mean, again, it's just basically that's the dimension of the Borel, and then you just have to make sure you, you correctly count automorphisms. So I'm not going to say anything about the, the proofs of all these theorems, um, but everything so far, and, and the theorems I'm going to state in a bit, are all proved in some very complicated uh, interwoven thing. Probably all I, all I want to say is there's, um, well, following Pappas and Rappaport, we kind of consider, uh, in an earlier paper, we, we considered moduli stacks of uh, Atal phi modules, so that's like this, but without the gamma. And then in this paper, we kind of upgrade that with the gamma action, and then we do something pretty complicated where we, on the one hand, consider the kind of families I'm talking about here of successive extensions of characters, and on the other hand, we compare to information coming from Piadic Hodge theory, so things about crystalline representations. Um, and it's actually the applications to Piadic Hodge theory that kind of motivated all this, so perhaps I will. Uh, I come to that shortly. Maybe first of all, I, I want to make sure I get one picture in this talk. So let me just kind of draw the picture of, of how this thing looks. And this is actually also, unfortunately, about the only case where I do have a nice picture. So in general, as I was saying, you have these very complicated specialization relations. And in particular, there's no, it turns out that these relations are sort of so uh, prevalent so that you can't really find a way to write down a coarse moduli space. So a coarse moduli space would be something like a kind of scheme which is, um, which is given basically by the closed points of this stack and is satisfies some universal property. Unfortunately, it turns out that, that beyond GL2QP, something quite strange happens and the, the various specialization relations kind of force such a scheme to collapse to a point. But for GL2QP, it turns out that I basically told you everything that happens. You have these families of non-split representations that can specialize either to split representations or to irreducible representations. And it turns out that uh, more or less what you get is sort of a chain of P1s. So let me just show you that. So I'm, I'm fixing the determinants in this, in this picture. And then what is this picture? This picture is supposed to be some kind of chain of P1s. These uh, points here, these purple points, um, are irreducible representations. So this is. Uh, I'm not going to explain this in any detail, but this is the induction of one of Serre's uh, Nevo 2 characters from a quadratic extension. And then this thing here is a twist of such a thing and so on. And this thing at the bottom, this, this uh, bottom thing here, is a zoomed in version of this thing here, this leftmost bit part. And what this blue thing here is telling you is what the kind of corresponding semi-simple reducible representation is along that P1. So along the P1, uh, there's kind of two points which are irreducible, sort of the zero and infinity point, and everywhere else you have this thing here where you have a fixed power of the thick atomic character, just the first power here, being multiplied by uh, an unramified twist. And because I've fixed my determinants, I've got the inverse of that twist here. Um, so, there's also a version of this picture um, where you kind of explain it by labeling by what are called Serre weights that I'll come to in a little bit. 
and uh, and that picture I think will appear in uh, Andrea Dotto's talk later in the week. So you'll see something like this again there. But this is kind of like the picture when you when you collapse all your representations to just the semi-simple ones, you end up with these these p ones crossing at irreducible representation. Okay, so I started to say something about a connection to uh, Piatic Hodge theory. So let me just briefly state what the theorem is here and uh, see why we care slightly. So again, I'm sticking with K to be QP, and I'm gonna fix uh, a tuple of integers, lambda one down to lambda D. And then the theorem we prove here is that there's a substack of our, of our stack of, of phi gamma modules, um, which is basically uniquely determined by the property that it picks out exactly the representations which are crystalline with Hodge tape weights given by lambda. So uh, again, if you don't know any periodic Hodge theory, um, this is maybe not super helpful, but the uh, rough idea is the crystalline is some kind of analog of unramified. If you're doing the, uh, the elliptic world, this is the kind of periodic version. So for example, if you take the tape module of an elliptic curve with good reduction at P, that will be something crystalline. And the Hodge tape weights are telling you something about the Hodge numbers, if the thing comes from geometry. So in that case, the Hodge tape weights would be uh, zero and one, or perhaps zero and minus one, depending on what you say. Okay, so we get the substack. This is something closed. That's what's the kind of the key point. Um, and this thing is actually piadic. So the, the topology on this thing is the is the piadic topology. And that means that the special fiber is actually an algebraic stack, not something formal. This thing really just kind of all its directions are algebraic. And you can compute the dimension. The dimension is basically the dimension of the flag variety corresponding to, uh, to kind of these weights. And in particular, if the, you're in the, the so-called regular case where the weights are strictly decreasing, they're all distinct, then it turns out that this special fiber uh, down here uh, is equidimensional of exactly the same dimension as the dimension of the underlying um, reduced stack. Of, of our, our whole modulized stack. So in other words, if you take this, this crystalline substack, it's something inside it which is quite a lot smaller, in, it turns out. I mean, the dimension of it is roughly this d choose two, whereas the dimension of the whole stack is supposed to be more like d squared. But it is genuinely a, an algebraic thing. It doesn't have these strange formal directions. You can really move algebraically here. And in particular, the special fiber uh, because it's equidimension of dimension equals to the uh, the dimension of this underlying reduced, the special fiber is actually just picking out some of these irreducible components from one of my earlier slides. Okay, uh, and I should say there's an analogous result, exactly the analogous result if I replace crystalline with semi-stable or with potentially semi-stable, and if I work over a general field, uh, I just have to have more notation for my, my Hodge tape weights and so on. Okay. So that's a, a theorem, and as I say, the proof of this is uh, proving that the, actually computing the dimension of this thing, having proved it exists, is a, is a relatively straightforward computation. You can sort of do a tangent-based computation, but in fact, the proof uh, that this is equidimensional of, of that same dimension as the whole underlying reduced to the stack is very much uh, tied up with the proofs of all the earlier theorems. There's some very complicated induction proving all these things. Well, let's ignore that and just, just use this statement. So the first reason, in fact, the original motivation for us constructing these stacks was something called the, the Brunner-Zar conjecture. So let me just very briefly say something about that. I think we may hear something more about it later in the week. Um, so as I just said, if I take this regular case where my Hodge tape weights are distinct, then this special fiber of this crystalline substack is equidimensional, and it's of the dimension uh, of the whole underlying reduced of the stack. So on the other hand, this special fiber need not be reduced. So what I can do is I can form what I call Z of lambda. I just take my stack, look, take the special fiber, and then I look at the, uh, I take the sort of the sum of the irreducible components that it's supported on, counted with their multiplicity. So if this thing has kind of, you know, if I, if I for example, if I, if somehow when I reduce mod P, I had something that looked like F, uh, fpx mod x squared, I would take a multiplicity two and so on. I just took a sort of multiplicity, a 
a generic point. Um, and then I'm presenting this slightly ahistorically, but uh, some 10 or 15 years ago, Broy and Mazar asked a question about this. Um, they kind of, they said, uh, in the context, not of these stacks, which didn't then exist, but the context of the, the sort of formal deformation rings of, of Mesa, which you get by taking just formal completions of points of this stack. They said, uh, kind of, which components do you get? Uh, what are these multiplicities? What does this mean? So actually, just very briefly, historically, actually, the Broimers are conjecture originally, uh, in a much earlier paper of theirs, was just purely about these multiplicities, and it was purely about these as numbers with no kind of geometric content. But now, uh, with these stacks and at hand, all of the questions just come down to the question of, can we describe which irreducible, com irreducible components this special fiber is supported on, and what the multiplicities are for each irreducible component? So that's a conjecture. And there's a conjectural answer to this. And I wonder if my slides are now frozen. Here we go. The conjectural answer to their question uh, is bound up with the Piedic local Langlands correspondence. So as I'll recall in a bit, that there is a case or several cases known of, of their conjecture. So on, answers to the question of what, what are the multiplicities what are the irreducible components? Uh, and it's all to do with Piedic Langland's correspondence, uh, which is mostly, of course, a conjecture. But maybe this is the, I, just, I thought this was kind of a good opportunity to, to present um, how I think these, these stacks that we've constructed have something to do with Piedic Langland. So the expectation is that on our stack XD of D dimensional representations of, uh, of the gap to Galagos of K, there should be some universal sheaf of representations over this, representations of the group GLDK, uh, and it should do the following things. So first of all, there should be some kind of local global compatibility. Um, when you pull back, if you, if, you're, if you look, for example, at a point of our stack, so that's a local GAL representation, if that local representation comes from a global situation, then I expect that this sheaf of representations should correspond to the kind of global completed cohomology of whatever locally symmetric space this global, this global Gal representation should, uh, should correspond to autonomic it forms on. Um, I expect this to encode the weight part of Serre's conjecture, which is hopefully the relevance for this workshop. I'll say something about that on the next slide. And I also expect that this, this sheaf should answer the question of Broy and Mazar. So something about this sheaf should tell you uh, about these special fibers of these crystalline stacks. And it should also do a lot more as well. I mean, this, this is not some complete list of properties that I expect the other local language to satisfy, but I think already this would be a pretty good deal if, if such a thing exists and can be found. Uh, so this is, this is extremely imprecise, and I don't want to make it too precise. I'll make some statements in the coming slides, but uh, in the Eladic analogous case, people have made some very precise conjectures recently. There's a paper of, of Eugen Hellman uh, on the archive and also a paper of Shimon Zhu on the archive uh, this year. And I think there's hopefully forthcoming work of NZV, Chen, Hellman, Nadler. Uh, this is all in, the, in various versions of the Eladic setting, but expressing a similar expectations of the existence of canonical sheaves of representations satisfying some local global compatibility. Um, so some evidence that this is not a totally unreasonable expectation is, of course, in the case of GL2QP, which is the only reasonable case to hope for anything at the moment, the only case where we have some kind of Piedic language. Uh, in joint work with Andrea Dotto and Matt Ellison, uh, we can construct these sheaves in this case and show that indeed it satisfies all these expected properties. It's actually not so surprising because uh, the proof of Piadic Langlands for GL2QP very much goes via Figal modules. Comers has a construction of uh, this thing, D box P1 mod D natural box P1, some universal family of, uh, of such representations, representations of GL2QP. And he at least constructs these over deformation rings, Mazer's deformation rings. And in fact, the construction can be made to work over the whole stack. Um, and so using that, we can, uh, we can make this construction in, in bigger families and show that it satisfies all of these, these properties. Okay, so 
let me try and connect it to the, the kind of subject of this workshop, to the weight part of Sayre's conjecture. Again, I'm sticking with QP, but everything I'm saying makes equal sense uh, in general, although everything's completely conjectural about the, the existence of this correspondence in general. So sigma is an FP bar representation, irreducible representation of, of GLDFP. So these are all algebraic. Uh, they're indexed by highest weights, P restricted highest weights. Uh, and if I'm just doing GL2, these are just the familiar representations. You take uh, determinants to some power times the uh, some small symmetric power of the, the standard two-dimensional representation. I'm going to admit the conjecture from the previous slide. So M, if you recall, was this, this kind of specific sheaf of, of representations of, of GLD. And given it, I'm going to just take uh, the kind of sigma isotopic part. So I've got some jewels here for purely technical reasons, so just ignore those. But the idea is you just take your irreducible representation of GLDFP. You can just project from GLD ZP down to GLD FP. This M is supposed to have an action of, of GLD of QP, and so in particular GLD ZP. Sigma has this action, and so I can just look at this, this thing. And it will follow from the, the kind of expectations that we have and the, about this, this uh, such a sheaf of representations, the support of this is just a union of irreducible components. So it's not supported on some random set of points. It's, its support is kind of full dimensional. So this is some, some sheaf. Now uh, I've got rid of the, the action of the GLD action. It's just, just some sheaf over the, the stack and its support is some, some union of components. Um, and in fact, I can then even consider the support with multiplicities and again, just define the cycle. So again, this is just some formal, this Z of sigma is just some formal uh, in non-negative integer sum of irreducible components. And then basically by a completely formal argument, if you, the expected local global compatibility holds that I was saying that if it's the case that when you pull back to global Gauss representations, you're compatible with completed cohomology, then it's just a formal consequence that the support of this, uh, of this Z of sigma, the, the irreducible components here, exactly tells you the weight part of Sayre's conjecture. And so in particular, in the setting of this work with uh, Andrea and Matt, uh, you can see that this is true for modular curves. So what I mean here is that the weight part of Sayre's conjecture is a question about what weights of mod p automorphic forms uh, a given global Gauss representation shows up with. And what this says is the answer is you take your global Gauss representation, restrict to the place above p, and then you just ask which, uh, for which sigmas, which, which weights, um, the corresponding local mod p representation lies on these, the, the corresponding components, the components of this zeta sigma. So there should be some purely local way of picking out a set of irreducible components of the stack, and then your modular of weight sigma, if and only if you lie on those components. Um, I'm presenting all this as a consequence of this, this hypothetical periodic Langlands setup, which you may find a bit uh, ambitious as a, as a conjecture. But I should say that something like this is certainly going to be true because you can, you can show that things like this more or less follow from things like the fontaine mesa langlands conjecture. So if you kind of believe anything about the sort of reciprocity between Gauss representations and autonomic forms, you're basically forced to believe there should be some statement like this. There should be some purely local uh, recipe given by just picking out irreducible components. But as I say, I expect that this, this is actually realized by some canonical uh, sheaves of representations over these stacks. Okay, so that was the weight part of Sayre's conjecture. I just wanted to also say why this answers this Broimazar question. So I'm going to make a similar construction here. So given um, this list of distinct Hodge Tate weights, uh, I can form an irreducible representation with corresponding uh, kind of highest weight given by the usual shift of these weights. So for example, if the, if the weights are... Uh, sort of zero, one, up to d minus one, I just look at the trivial representation and so on. And then I can do a similar thing to what I did before. I can sort of pick out the sort of 
lambda isotopic part of this sheaf. So this is just a characteristic zero uh, or an integral analog of what I was doing just now for the, uh, the set weights. And then again, the expectations that I gave you before um, imply that if I take the underlying cycle of, uh, of, this, of this sheaf, um, I should get the same thing that I called Z of lambda earlier. So this thing here, by definition, is just the, uh, the underlying cycle of the special fiber of the crystalline stack with this weight. Uh, so this expectation is basically just the fact that I expect that my, my stack, uh, my, my, sorry, my conjectural sheaf of representations will have the property that the, the sort of lambda part of it is supported over the entire crystalline locus. This is uh, certainly going to be true, but probably hard to prove. Okay, so then the nice thing is once you have this, this setup that I'm giving myself, you immediately get an answer to this question of Roy Mezar. So the point is that uh, this, uh, this representation, pi of lambda, this algebraic representation, I can just reduce that mod p and decompose it uh, so if I reduce it mod p, I get something that's um, not irreducible anymore. And I can look at the, the multiplicities with which these, these individual stair weights occur. And then it's just a completely formal consequence of the definitions, just the way that cycles add, that uh, this z of lambda, because it's equal to this z of this sheaf m of lambda, and then I'm decomposing the, the pi lambda into these sigmas, I get that the z of lambda is just given as a formal sum over these cycles z sigma that we've, we've determined on the previous slide, and the multiplicities are the multiplicities uh, with which the stair weights occur in these representations. So this is a, a restatement of the original conjecture of Broy and Mazar, even if you now pass from this uh, geometric version, if you take multiplicities and just get actual numbers, if you take Hilbert Samuel multiplicities, you get back the conjecture that Broy and Mazar made in the uh, I guess around 2000. Um, but it's now it becomes almost an automatic consequence of expectations we have about the existence of Gaelic Langhams in general. So as I say, it's known in some cases, it's known for GL2QP uh, that this is true, uh, and it's a consequence of work uh, of first of all Mark Kissin and then Vitas Tashkunas and various people have gone on to kind of uh, fill in the kind of cases that they missed. Uh, and this is proved by using periodic local Langlands. So in some sense, the way the proof goes is you take Colmez's periodic local Langlands um, and consider that um, as a sheaf, you consider it as a sheaf, if you like, over the local deformation ring and then apply this kind of argument. Uh, of course, in that setting, it's just, you can consider it just as a module for a local deformation ring, but basically the argument that I'm outlining here, the expectation, uh, is how the proof goes. It just it, it works in this world of, of formal deformation rings instead of this more uh, this more global stack universe. And you can also extend this line of thought and and the conjecture and and this the proof that, that we have in that case to the potentially crystalline and potentially semi-stable case. Uh, it's just instead of just using this algebraic highest weight representation, you also have um, a contribution, a sort of smooth contribution from the inertial local angle. And the advantage of working in that setting where you can think about um, not just the crystalline case, but the potentially crystalline case, and maybe have some kind of interesting uh, inertial action is that you can sometimes get something that's a little easier to prove. It turns out that if the Hodge take weights are small, um, but you're allowing yourself to make things more difficult by considering some ramified extensions, it's still sometimes easier than the high weight case. So there are results known beyond the case of GL2QP, uh, the potentially bus body take case I proved with Mark, and then the recent work of uh, Lee, Le, Le Hung, uh, Levin, and Mora. I think we might hear a bit more about some related things in, uh, in their talks later in the week, uh, proved statements like this for, for GLN with sort of small Hodge take weights, but allowing ramification of some kind. Okay, well, I'm almost done, but I just wanted to kind of relate this back down to something more usual because no construction is known of this, this periodic local Langlands sheaf other than for GL1, where it's not so interesting, or GL2QP, where, as I say, we can make this Comez construction work 
uh, in families. But uh, Terry Ali, Emerson, Geraghty, Pashtunas, and Shin, where we constructed a, a kind of candidate for this correspondence in that case. Now that, that construction is, uh, has its deficiencies because it's a global construction, uses Taylor Wiles patching. Uh, and in particular, it's not at all clear that the thing you construct is independent of a lot of global choices. On the other hand, if you believe that there, as I do, that there are these local sheaves and they satisfy some compatibility with pullback to the global situation, then this, this, uh, this construction will be compatible with this and the, the earlier construction of ours will give the kind of formal completions of these sheaves. Um, and perhaps if you've never seen this before, I should have motivated this earlier, this geometric Roy Mazar conjecture, when you pull back to this, this formal versal situation, it's actually proving statements of this are exactly equivalent to proving certain automorphy lifting theorem. So in fact, the, the proofs in general that we have of anything tend to go back and forward between proving kind of local statements about these local deformation rings and global statements about um, automorphy lifting theorems. So the work that Kitson originally did on this question, he was proving uh, cases of fontaine Mazer conjecture for GL2 over Q, and it was exactly using this correspondence. And again, you have some, some kind of different techniques there, which, are, which kind of go into the results that I mentioned at the bottom of the last slide. Um, things like when you get to this global situation, you can use things like solvable base change and so on. Um, but I think I just want to stop there. Uh, sorry for getting a minute over. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Toby, for this, this uh, fascinating and impressive talk. And uh, so the floor is, is now open for questions. Uh, actually, first, if you can sort of give a show of, uh, of hands using the, the reactions button for this uh, incredible uh, first talk, that'd be nice. And uh, anyone who wishes to uh, ask a question, please use the same reaction button, but use the raise your hand button so I can see you and uh, and give you um, the permission to, to speak, uh, unmute you. So uh, please, uh, anyone who is interested in, in asking uh, a question, please go ahead, raise your hand. Um, including uh, co-organizers. <laughs> um, okay, I hope it's, Yeah, hey, there are two questions. Yu uh, Yeshu, Shi Yang Wu. Uh, Guillermo, I, uh, for some reason, I cannot see the people who've raised their hand. So if you see them, uh, please uh, allow one of them to ask the question. Yes, yeah, hold a second. Uh, oh, I, I now one. I see one. Eran Asaf? Yes. I, uh, so, um, There's another Elan, one. you should be able now to, to go ahead and ask your question. Uh, hi, Yal. Hi, Toby. Hello. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to ask, so in the case of QP, um, it, the phi gamma modules are uh, natural in a sense, but uh, in the case of an extension, which type of phi gamma modules do you use? So there are several choices that could be made there. Um, Toby? Ah, sorry, I think everyone got muted at the end. <laughs> can you hear yes. me now? Yes, we can. Okay, yes. sorry. <laughs> I've got too many screens. Um, so, yeah, so I was saying that, that there are a bunch of choices you can make, um, and it doesn't really matter. So, for example, you can think about either using the cyclotomic, full cyclotomic extension or the par partial one. Um, you can, I mean, so one thing that, that I think it, it comes up a lot in the proofs is there's no canonical choice in general. So it, I've got my Laurel series ring here, but then inside it's the power series ring. And the power series ring, those, those formulas I write down for phi and gamma, um, 
kind of work nicely there. And it turns out that in, in the general setting, there's no nice choice of power series variable to make that work. Uh, it also just turns out not to matter. So there's, it's, there's there are various other equivalent descriptions. So I, it turns out that actually one thing you can do is, is completely forget about the gamma modules and something a bit more canonical is you can work with um, so phi modules over, uh, like if I'm working mod P, I can just work with phi modules over C flat. So this, um, this big perfect extension. Uh, com equipped with a commuting action of the gaps to Galois group. So I have a fee module, and I have an action of the action of the Galois group on that. I can just work with the moduli space of those. The disadvantage mm -hmm. of doing that is that uh, if you work with that, it's not at all obvious that you have something finite type. Um, and so you end up using the fee gamma modules to prove fi finite type properties. Uh, but for those, it doesn't really matter what kind of fee gamma modules you're using. Um, and what choices you've made, you you tend to, you eventually just come down to the fact that you want, you basically reduce the same kind of things that Pappas and Rappaport are doing. You you use, eventually you get down to some, is it, what's important is that there's some descent to some imperfect situation where you have like power series rings instead of perfect rings. And in that setting, you can use the fee to get some bounds of some kind. But in the end, you never really care about what, I mean, you, ne you never do something by explicitly writing down fee gamma modules, except for the purpose of giving a talk or something. Um, it's, it's the fact that they exist and there is some kind of imperfect thing that you can work with that, that, that matters. I see. Thanks. Okay. Um, I see that uh, there's actually a question from Michael Shine, and he also told me that for some reason he cannot uh, raise his hand uh, like using the, the Zoom button. So some people uh, apparently have technical problems uh, raising their hand. Uh, in this case, just uh, use the chat uh, to, yeah. to sort of let me know. And um, okay, where did Michael Shine disappear now? <laughs> um, I'm here. Oh, okay. Hi, Michael. So uh, yes, please go ahead, Michael. Yeah, so can you, I mean, can you somehow, I mean, do you know anything about the combinatorics of the intersections of your, of your irreducible components, or say even in the patching case of the six author paper, to sort of say which sets of SARE weights can appear as the modular weights of some representation? So, I mean, for GL2, you can make it very explicit in some sense. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, extremely explicit in the end, like literally given a GAL representation, you can work it out in this paper of, um, uh, Dembele, Diamond, and Roberts, um, the scene of Red and David Roberts, they made it like, something very explicit. Um, I, in generic situations, there's this recent work of um, Lei Le Hung, um, Levin, and Mora, um, who proved that for sufficiently generic parts of the pitch, so kind of sufficiently far away from sort of the walls of chambers, you can kind of say something explicit in some geometric representation theory terms. Um, and there's also, as you know, there's things like Florian's conjectures, again, sufficiently far away from the walls. But my guess is, my, my kind of perspective is that in general, like if I want to take uh, and, you know, the dimension to be even four or something, and I want to work and to say all components and how they intersect even over QP, I think you just, I don't really expect that there's going to be a good answer that's, that's combinatorial. I think, I think what this kind of picture tells you is that in the end, the answer to the questions of which their weights occur is just complicated. That's, that's my own personal view. Um, and I don't think that um, what we, what, anything that, that we do in this formal way just doesn't really tell you anything useful to answer that question. So I say like there is this work, um, this LLM stuff where they relate it to some to more geometric representation theory constructions um, that maybe gives you some kind of answer. But again, I think the answer is you're getting relations to things like casual analytic multiplicities and so on. And, and I think everything just is sort of telling you that in the end, you, you don't expect to get a complete combinatorial ex description of everything. I guess a, a sort of similar question that people ask sometimes, so I'll just try and answer as well, is that you could ask if you take representations of GL2 if you look at the GL2 QP case and, and look at the reductions mod P of crystalline representations, then you can ask for a formula for those, an explicit description. And again, I think that's probably 
too much to hope for. Like I think this kind of nice qualitative statement that it is these questions have answers given by irreducible components meeting in some way is, is kind of good. But I think in general, the geometry of these things is actually pretty complicated. I don't know if that answers the question. Thank you. Okay, so um, there's there's a question from uh, Tony Frank. Tony, Tony Frank, please go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm just wondering. Um, now that you have the stack, what's what's your next step? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I mean, finishing this project with Andrea and, and Matt, and actually writing this thing up for GLTQP is an obvious step. Um, and then there are, uh, I mean, the, the questions that most interest me are whether you can use these stacks to prove things like new cases of this Broimazar conjecture, new, new modularity lifting theorems. And of course, there's the question of whether you can actually prove anything about periodic diagonals beyond GL2QP, like whether you can actually find, for example, constructions for local candidates for these, these sheaves that I'm expecting exist. Um, I mean, I think there's also a whole bunch of other questions of, of, that are important of, about, you know, constructing versions of these stacks for other groups, um, that kind of thing, thinking more about their geometry. But, but to me, the most interesting things are probably the relation to geometric problems are and, and to Piero Langley. Cool, thanks. Um, there's a question from uh, Zixian Wu. I'm trying to unmute him. Uh, I'm asking him to unmute. Sorry, I don't have okay. a question. Sorry, yeah. I don't okay. know what happened. Right. Okay. We can hear you now. You. No, no, no. I don't have a question. Sorry. Oh, you don't have a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know why okay. you why it shows I have a question. Oh, okay. Uh, are there are there any other questions? Um. Well. Um, I can't see any, so uh, there, there seem to be some glitches with the Zoom, but since I can't see any more, uh, it's, it's, let's just uh, thank uh, Toby again for, uh, for his great talk and answering the questions.